Are you struggling to come up with original content week in and week out? Start a podcast. Interview your ideal clients. Let them talk about what they care about most and never run out of content ideas again. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I am your host for today's episode, Nikki Ivey with Sweetfish Media. I've got with me today, Virginie Glanzer, who is the founder at Acorn Oak. Virginie, how are you doing today? I'm really well. Thank you, Nikki, for inviting me on your show. I'm excited to share what I've learned and just have a conversation with you. Yeah, I got to tell you already so far, your energy has been so peaceful and calming (laughs) and yet I'm engaged, right? I'm, I'm trying to get into this. This is going to be fun. And what we're going to be talking about today are some untapped strategic opportunities. We love those, right? To succeed as business owners, as particularly as, uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs. Uh, but before we get into all of that, Virginie, I would love it if you would just give us a little bit of background on yourself and what you and the folks at Acorn Oak have been up to these days. Sure. Should I go a little bit about my background? How I, because I'm sure you've noticed my accent. Yes. Yes. Tell us about this beautiful accent. Sure. So I'm originally born and raised in Paris in France, and I moved in 99 to San Francisco Bay Area with four suitcases. Didn't speak as well as I do today, although I'm sure there's a lot of words that I still can pronounce. So I spent about 17 years in Northern California. I co-founded two techs companies, started in a Motel 6, uh, eating a 99 uh, cents cheeseburger. And um, looking back, I really was grateful for this journey. I led two startup, tech startup for about 10 years. Uh, the first one was a very, had a very short life. And the second was a little bit more successful. I was able to buy myself a, a nice house in Mountain View, the Google headquarters. And so I did that for about 10 years. And then I went back to, to uh, corporate world and I fell in love with marketing. I was already uh, originally doing sales and then I ended up doing marketing to support my own sales background. So I did that for a few years until the startup that I was working for got uh, acquired. I was hired by the CEO to change the marketing strategy and the brand positioning so potential acquirers could actually see the company. And when the acquisition happened a year and a half after, we the, the team moved to Seattle, Washington. And at the time, uh, you know, after 17 years in Northern California, I was ready to move. I mean, the world is big. And I was looking at the East Coast, uh, but I got a little bit tired of the, you know, the blue sky of California and people being politically correct. So mm-hmm. I thought I was ready to move to the East Coast. And I moved about seven years ago to New York. I've been VP marketing for a few organizations, actually three organizations, but twice I was asked to leave, maybe because I was not bringing enough coffee or being nice enough. That's a whole other discussion, Um, but I learned a lot. I was doing digital marketing transformation for those organizations, and I learned a lot along the way. Started my third startup, which I ran for about a year, invested my own money, and after a year, failed and had to... um, I had to close the business. It was a new concept of a co-working space for freelancers in in a retail space. So learned a lot. And then I found myself doing a little bit of consulting for very small companies. And I loved it. And since then, in the last uh, eight months, I started my own agency called uh, Acorn Oak. And what we do is we help very small businesses and solo entrepreneurs, really companies that, you know, 
most likely don't have a lot of marketing budget, don't have um, a VP of marketing, and we help them grow through digital innovation or digital marketing. And we take care of not just the strategy, but also the campaigns. And uh, one particular thing about uh, Acorn Oak is that we, or I want to grow the company with women of experience. I think there's an aging discrimination in business in general. And I want to support women who are either in transition or trying to get back and who haven't been in, in, you know, in a job for a few years. But so we're now just three women over 50 uh, or close to being 50. And uh, it's been quite a ride. And yeah, so... You gave me so much more than I could have ever <laughs> expected. And I'm so glad you did. There is so much in there, Virginie. So like, I listen, I, you kind of glazed over the fact that this idea of not being nice enough or bringing enough coffee. But since what we're going to be talking about, one of the things we're going to be talking about here, one of those strategic opportunities that we're going to hit on is hiring female executives uh, if you want your business to thrive, listen, I champion that idea. So within, I hope you will give us a little nugget about that experience uh, when, you, when you talk to us uh, about this idea of, of how hiring female executives can help your business thrive. Dig into it for us. Sure. And it's really one of those no-brainers, but no one thought of it. So I deal with a lot of small business owners, mid-sized companies, and the data is just out there. It's, it's not even a question now. It, one of the things as an entrepreneur or as a small business owner, if you want to thrive, hire a female executive. And the reason is women are not about competition. They're about collaboration. The data shows that companies with the highest representation of women on their top management team will have better financial performance. Um, so having, whether it's women on your boards or on your executive team, will boost your investment returns. I mean, it's, it's you know, companies with strong female leadership delivers 36% higher return on equity, according to uh, the index provider MSCI. That's it. It's, it's just a no-brainer. And so it's one of those things that are overlooked. And I know it's a big topic these days. But if you have the opportunity to hire a woman in your executive team, you're making a long-term, a better decision from a, a return standpoint. And I've, I've heard, I talked to a lot of uh, men. I, one of my clients is actually launching a woman leadership program. So in that context, I had the chance to talk to a lot of CMOs and CEOs of large and Fortune 500 companies. And of course, I'm hearing their perspective, which is, I'm more comfortable, you know, those who are actually open to being true to their, you know, experience, a lot of them will say, well, I don't know that many women, or sure. I'm more comfortable around men. But again, either you're looking to stay comfortable, or you're looking to uh, increase the return of your company. And that's what you're focusing on, then just hire an exec a woman as in your executive team. It's that simple. Boom, gavel. You know what? The numbers bear that out, right? I've heard this argument before as well. The scarcity, well, not a lot of women, uh, not a lot of women applied for this job and things like that. And that may be true, but you don't, you don't stop there, right? If you know that, you know, the numbers bear out female executives being, you know, adding to the bottom line, right? Mm -hmm. Then to stop at, oh, there just weren't as enough that came to me versus going out and going to them. Uh, is, you know, kind of kind of lazy, kind of irresponsible. But what I think is cool these days, and you let me know your opinion on this, is there are a few pieces of uh, technology that are out there that are looking to facilitate this sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like make it easier, like create a platform where, you know, employers can go, businesses can go and find talent pools that are, you know, comprised more heavily of these mm -hmm. historically underrepresented groups. There is technology that is geared at mitigating these biases, these implicit biases that sometimes folks mm -hmm. don't know, which, I, which I'm, I'm guessing is where you were going as far as though maybe I didn't smile enough or get enough coffee. Um, <laughs> th that's, that's these, right, these un, sometimes in, unknown to the, to the perpetrator biases that, that happen. And, you know, we were at a point where you're right, we were sort of stalled there. Um, there's still so much work to do, but thankfully there is a lot of technology that is looking 
uh, to mitigate that. In fact, I've got some names I'm going to shoot you after we get off this, uh, yeah. <laughs> this call of some of the folks that are that are leading that charge. A couple of them uh, are actually men. So I, I say actually men. Men can do good stuff for women oh, too. Absolutely. Uh, and I we, think it's, yeah, it's key to work with men. It's, yeah. This is not about, you know, focusing on just bringing on women. This is about finding this balance between men and women. Right. We're talking about inclusion is what we're talking about. Right. right? And we're we're talking about like, we're talking about elevating the profession. I think sales and marketing are at uh, an inflection point when it comes to what our identity is and what it's going to be, what it needs to be. Right. And a lot of that conversation is around valuing certain skills in particularly in salespeople and and in leaders, right. Valuing so-called soft skills, right. Like empathy and emotional intelligence and things that a lot of science would attribute to women more often than men uh, in general, but just in general, since we're already looking for some of those, some of those, you know, traits, some of those features, and we're already sort of going through this, who are we going to be conversation or inflection point? I think it makes sense right now to be even more intentional about what the composition is of the workforce. And I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So this, this episode is, is veered very directly <laughs> into a lot of my opinions, which I don't typically do, right. but it's something I'm passionate about. And I think that we talked about this on the show a lot. I think that you, you have to take stands on things, right? Mm-hmm. And this does not always have to be adversarial. It does not at all have to be adversarial, but in right. no uncertain terms, hear me if you're listening, uh, I love you to death. Um, but I'm not, I don't back down on this. The numbers bear out higher female executives. I think we made that case. So moving on. Yes. Uh, another stand, <laughs> Virginia. I love. Yes, and I think just to one. yes, just to finish on this topic, this is not about trying to change the bias, the education mm-hmm. that we've received, the way we react, mm-hmm. right? And having this hot discussion on men versus women. Sure. This is about just understanding that as an entrepreneur and a small business owner, what you want is to grow your organization, and one way is to get is to a higher female executive because the data shows that if you have a balanced team you're more likely to have a higher return that's it so right. you know it's not an yep. emotional conversation it's it's a choice yep. if that's what you're looking for then that's one way to achieve it now there's exactly. always going to be excuses or i can find them or whatever it is it it starts with a choice of where do i want to go so For today's growth story, we'll be talking about Clear Company, a fast-growing talent management platform. Clear Company was acquiring a decent number of users, but they weren't happy with their organic traffic or conversions. Clear Company turned to Directive, the B2B search marketing agency. To help increase their overall search visibility for core keywords in order to drive more organic traffic and bottom of the funnel leads. After identifying the core target keyword and analyzing the first page of Google results, Directive executed a content and digital PR strategy to rank Clear Company number one on the first page of Google for the high intent keyword. In just five months, that one piece of content generated 27 demo requests and 1,902 referring domains, an all-time high for Clear Company. If you're looking for results like this with your search engine marketing, there's a good chance Directive can help. Visit directiveconsulting.com and get a free customized proposal. All right, let's get back to the show. To be clear, the, the technology that I mentioned as far as biases, it's it's along the lines that you're talking about. So it does it takes the emotion out of it and it's looking to have just the, the algorithm, the software seek out and try and mitigate those biases without it having to come to those often uncomfortable conversations or having to come to those questions or, or heated debates. It's like, no, forget all of that. What does the data say about exactly. whether or not there is a what bias do we want to ac- in the technology? Yeah. Right. And yeah. what do we want to accomplish? So what are the tools? What are the ways? This is one way you can choose to go or not. But I thought that I would bring up this choice, which is overlooked and not necessarily uh, talked in this context of achieving higher growth. Exactly. I'm so glad. I'm so, I was already (laughs) glad to have you on the show, but I'm so glad that you, that you went ahead and laid that out for us. Another stance that you take guys stay with me is I know I'm I know there's a lot of marketers out there listening to this show, but uh, Virginie says you got to recognize that marketing is dead. Uh, and welcome to relationing. 
which is going to replace marketing. Go ahead and uh, flesh this out for us here, Virginie. Sure. So yes, marketing is dead and we are coming up with it. We have to reinvent marketing. I mean, since ever since people had something to sell, we've been marketing, right? But the effectiveness of those marketing methods are being decreased. And the reason is there's a number of reasons. One of them is there's so many choices that the noise level have uh, has increased. And so it's becoming really difficult to launch a new product or just to connect with your customers. So that's number one. Number two, the fact that people overwhelm with information, social media, which originally made it easy to engage with your customer using you know, marketing and social media has become very difficult because the attention span has been low, you know, decreasing and it's, you know, it's just difficult. So we know that marketers and there's some very good marketers out there are going to great lengths to make it happen. And, but they're, it, it's paying, we're paying the cost of losing sight of the customer's pain. And so that's why marketing in general, if you look at the words, even the words that we're using, it's a very aggressive uh, practice. We're talking about hooking and tracking and retargeting and competitive analysis and offensive strategy, right? It's like almost who are we fighting against? And so what I'm thinking, and I've been in marketing for the last 20 years, so I've seen things evolve and I'm a big believer in social media and building a new type of relationship. And we've seen some brands coming up with, you know, uh, raising the bar in terms of building a relationship and letting customers dictate what they want, right? So relationing is a new way of positioning marketing. And it's almost like changing our expectations. So relationing is what it means. It's, it means finding a new way to be in a relationship for your customers, being actually the relationship maker. So let me explain. In relationship, the marketing and the brand game, the new game, has three objectives. The first one is to connect people who want what the brand has to offer with the brand. So connection. Second is to find more people who love the brands or the service. And then the third is to give those people control as an opportunity for them to become brand advocates so they can shape the future of the brand. So there's a uh, giving the control over to those people. So we've, we've created five, the five R's for the marketers out there who are familiar with the, um, the four P's of marketing, which evolve into the seven P's. It was price, promotion, product, place, packaging, positioning, and people right? Well, we have now the five R's of relation. The first one is reason. What's the reason for the customer to buy, right? What's the value prop, the benefit in the eyes of the customer? So this requires a shift. It's no longer about why you, as the the founder or the, the marketer, believe that people should be interested. It's from your customer perspective. And so that's the reason why. The second is the relation. How does the brand relate to people's lives? You know, what are the core value you share with your customers? Do you have similar view of the world? What story do you share to create a desire for them to be in relation with you? So second is relation. The third is relationship. How can the brand, the brand build a relationship with its customers? What are the functional and emotional benefits? The fourth is reach. That's the easiest one. How do you, how do do your customers find you? Where can they buy it? It's no longer just online and offline. It's, it's global. And the fifth one is responsibility, which is what is your product sustainability strategy? Do you have a recycled packaging or materials and are your suppliers respectful of human rights and eco-friendly, right? What are your distribution channel that you're using that are carbon friendly? And do you have any recycling program in place? So these are the four, uh, the the five P's of relation. Reasons, relation, relationship, reach, and responsibility. So that's what I've been working on, trying to, you know, think through the noise and, and come with a way to think differently about how do you grow a company and how do you bring that to life to people who have so many choices that don't really care about what you do, but what Mm -hmm. they truly care about is how your product or your service make them feel 
about themselves. And if exactly you, right, if you take that last piece, you we need to change marketing. So if if this is no longer about your product or your service, that people don't care about what you do, but they care about how your product or your brand make them feel about themselves, we need to rethink marketing. And that's what For I'm sure. For sure. And you know what? That's one of the things that, and I've talked about this on this show before, but I don't think it can stress it enough. That element of focusing on how you can make people feel about themselves is something that B2C marketing has gotten right and leveraged for a very long time. And while B2B, particularly B2B SaaS, has leaned so heavily because these tend to be tech solutions, it started by folks who were excited about the tech itself has leaned so heavily on the product and how proud and excited they were to bring this to the people uh, that we, you know, we did sort of lose, miss an opportunity as far as focusing on how to make people feel about themselves. And I think maybe we didn't recognize that that opportunity existed, but it absolutely does. I know, I know that those moments as a salesperson, when I had been able to, you know, connect with the person on that level, on how I can make them feel about themselves, whether that's you know, making them feel like, Hey, maybe your day to day doesn't have to be the grind that it is, you know, Mm -hmm. or, you know, your, your future, your year over year that you're thinking about, you know, you're not going to have to go out and and, and get that and skip vacations and and do all the things that you thought you were going to have to do because we can fix some inefficiencies that can get you there. When I'm able to make that connection, it resonates so much more than this features and benefits thing. And I think that that's again, part of that identity thing that tells us going through quite Virginie, you have given us so much value and there are a few other things I would love to get to. I don't know. We're we're probably just going to have to have you on again because I have to get to this question or else my my listeners will be mad with me. Um, People are going to want to know after I've been able to pick your brain and see what I could get out of it and all your experience. I need to know what you're putting in it. What is it? Tell us a learning resource that you've engaged with here recently that's, you know, informing your approach or that you're just excited about. So these days, I'm actually uh, diving into something that I don't know if it's connected to psychology or anthropology or marketing or business. It's Mm -hmm. called ritual, ritual, rituals. Do you you know what that means? R I I don't even rituals. Yes. So the impact of rituals in business and particularly in digital marketing and how uh, if an organization lacks rituals. It actually, so lacking rituals as an organization creates threats. And Hmm. yeah, so it's, I'm exploring that. I'm thinking, so I'm using Twitter a lot. Um, My handle is Virginie G. And I follow, I have a list of people with topics that I'm interested in. And I follow very few people um, because otherwise the noise is just a two. Sure. But, but I do, every time someone connects, I do engage with them and try to see what they're all about. And I use lists for that. So I'm thinking I recently engaged with someone who's an expert on that topic. He's an independent consultant on the topic of ritual. And I'm thinking about putting together not a podcast, but a video a small private like a group of two to five where we would he would be the presenter and we would have a conversation so with other marketers so if they or if anyone is curious about how does rituals in the business world how do you connect those two and what kind of impact what does that even mean yeah what are the opportunity? yeah then <laughs> i will invite you you'll find something i just pitch him the idea about why don't we do this because i want to know more i want to dive and understand it means as a marketer, as a business owner, and can I improve people's lives through creating rituals in, in that relationship that I'm trying to get to have between my brands and customers or for my customers and their own clients? Yeah, so, yeah. That's I what love I mean. it. You're, you're so full of surprises, like <laughs> the best kind of surprises. I have absolutely enjoyed this. I've been delighted. And I know that just like me, folks listening are becoming fast fans of yours and going to want to know how to get in touch with you. Let us know how can people connect with you? Besides, I know you gave us your Twitter handle. Uh, how can sure. what's the best uh, way? I'm a pretty open book, so they can find me on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, Virginie Glenzer, and then otherwise on my website at acornoak.net. And I'm again, pretty open book. So easy to find me. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm so serious about having you on the show again. I need to hear what happens with uh, this ritual. So, by the way, I love the way you pronounce the word ritual. <laughs> I love the way you pronounce most words. I'm obsessed with you. It's fine. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much wonderful. for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to sharing it on social media and maybe more. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.